Well, yesterday we talked a lot about being in this new positional relationship with God that I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And obviously my physical body isn't seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. I'm still here upon the earth. I'm still you know, hooked up to terra firma. But at the same time, the, my spirit, my, my soul has been really transported into a new position, a new kind of authority that I have with God, that I have the capacity because of the Holy Spirit living in me to live as if I'm in heaven even now. And so Jesus came into the world and became a man to demonstrate how that we could live the, a godly life, a God-like life in this sin-filled world, and that we had the ability to live above and beyond our sinful human nature, our natural inclination, and that we could consistently choose to say yes to the will of God as Jesus did, except he did it without failure, without sin. He did it perfectly. We don't, but nonetheless, that's why he's given us the gift of repentance and confession that uh, a Christian who lives in daily confessional relationship with God is not a Christian who is failing, but rather a Christian who is succeeding. Every time I say, Father, forgive me for thinking that thought. God, forgive me for using those words. God, forgive me for acting in that way. That every time I do that, not only does that remove the guilt and the shame in a very real way, but it also has a capacity to remove it in my heart if my theology is correct. And that's where we talked on Monday about having the right theology. God says, if I confess my sins, he is just and he is faithful to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Think about that for a moment. I often translate it this way, that if I'm willing to admit that I am wrong and that I've sinned against God, if I'm willing to acknowledge that my attitude or my words or my actions were wrong, if I'm willing to admit that, God says, I'll not only forgive you, so that you don't have to give account for that. I'll take that off the books. It'll be removed. But I will also fix you so that something will transform inside of you where you won't, won't want to do that anymore. And that's where Paul, as we talked about his, his metaphor of putting on and putting off, that he says not only will you find yourself disrobing you through your confession, and that's often how we take those robes of sin off. We confess that they're filthy, rotten robes, and we're willing to take them off, or willing to allow God to remove them, and we put on his white robes of righteousness. And the right word righteousness, simply put, is to be in right relationship with God. I put on a garment that God looks at and says, I like that on you. You look best when you have my righteousness on. And believe it or not, we're so obsessed in this day and age with people's outward appearances that we can begin to think that that's the most important thing. The reality is that our appearance is insignificant to God. It's not that who I am or what I look like or what my health or welfare is like is, is not important to God. It's just not the significant thing. It's not the most, thing, the most important thing. And as I said yesterday, there are certain things that are necessary, but the danger is, is when we make necessary things the most important things in our life. And we begin to give unnecessary attention to necessary things. For example, people like my wife and I here, we're you know in our 70s and, and uh, the clock seems to be speeding up all the time. And we look at the future and say, okay, what, what's gonna happen in the future? What happens in the day when the body doesn't respond? What happens in the day when the brain doesn't really fire on all its cylinders? You know, you begin to lose that short-term memory or worse. What if it happens if we get cancer or one of us dies and the other's a widow or a widower? And you start to think about all those things and you can allow yourself to be so caught up in worrying about those things that you overlook the more important thing of that basically this is a day which uh, the Lord has made and I will be glad and rejoice in it. That it's so important that we're not look, trying to live in the future and control the future that we overlook the present moment we're in. Because God very clearly says to us and repeatedly, uh, repeatedly in various places that he'll take care of us all our life. David said, I, I was young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous uh, going hungry or their seed begging bread. You know, Jesus said he, he'll take care of us. And so, you know, some way or another, and it doesn't mean that you don't do anything, but sometimes you find yourself doing things because you feel that's what God wants you to do. And you discover later on that God was busy making preparation and taking care of you and watching over your future needs. And you didn't have to lose as much sleep at night as you did. 
And the reason he says that it's important is where we're at next in verse 3, where Paul goes on and says, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Now, what do you mean, I've died? I, I feel like I'm still alive. Well, I love what one paraphrase put it this way. They said, your old life is dead, as far as God's concerned. Whoever you were in the past, that's gone. And for some of you, it's really important for you to get your hands around that because you feel really bad about your past. Maybe your past is just yesterday, but you're dead to that in Christ. That's under the blood. It's, it's been washed away. And he says, your new life, which is your real life, even though it's invisible to spectators, you know, your new life is who you are that God sees, sometimes only God is aware of it, is with Christ in God. He is now your new life. And so what happens, I think, for us, and this is always a challenge, is we look at the material world as being so real, and yet God says in Hebrews, the material world is really just a shadow. It's a shadow of what is real. And shadows are marvelous things. I mean, uh, <laughs> The, the other night, my wife and I were sitting out in the back. We have a little fire pit, and we were sitting out there talking. And my wife looked over my storage, she said, and shed, and said, did you leave the lights on? And I looked, and I said, I don't think so. And I walked around as I got closer. I realized that the light of the fly, fire was reflecting off the side of the building, and it made it look like there was a light on the inside of the building when, in fact, there was no light near it at all. In other words, it was an illusion. It was a, a thing that looked to be real, but it was not real. And that's what Jesus says. We end up getting caught up in the shadows of this world that portray themselves as being real and important and essential. They keep us awake at night. They make us not want to get up in the morning. We go through these dynamics and we fail to realize that the only thing that is real because the only thing that is eternal is not the things of this material life, but it's what's true in heaven. And so that's why he goes on to say that as a Christian, what I need to do is have my heart anchored in that hope, not anchored in hoping my life turns out well, not living for my best life now, but realizing that ultimately my life is only going to begin in its true fullness when I'm no longer here. So that <clears throat> I tell people when a loved one dies and we weep and we mourn, of course we do and we should because we've lost something that's vital and important to us. But let me assure you, if they're Christians, they're feeling no pain. <laughs> and, they, and they wouldn't want to come back and live here with you in this world. They'd basically say, I'll wait for you there. When you get there, then we can rejoice and celebrate together. Because we live in this ever-changeable world. I think about how people in the celebrity world, it's almost like, what have you done for us lately? People can rise to great fame and be destroyed simply by a rumor overnight. And everything that they thought they had gained, they lose very, very quickly. Well, that's the nature of it. I mean, that's the, that's the nature of life on this earth. Easy come, easy go. Hard come, it's easy go too. It just doesn't really last. There's nothing here that lasts. And that's why that, the poem that my pastor used to always quote over and over again has stuck in my brain. One life will soon be passed, but only that which is done for Christ will last. And if you can keep that in focus, that it's the things that I'm doing for eternity that have eternal worth and they're investments that will go before me. And that's really where my retirement is resting, not in some bank or brokerage account here upon the earth. And so it really comes down to what is my hope as a Christian? And hope is a very important dynamic because hope is the thing that formulates in your mind your view of the future. What are you hoping in? To lose hope means that you've given up on God, that you don't believe God is working everything together for the good. And we've all been there, we've gone through those seasons, but somehow the Holy Spirit has a way of reviving that faith in us so that we know that the best is yet to come. Maybe not even on this earth, but it's coming in the future. And so it affects how I view the present and it also affects what I pursue into the future. And so that's why in verse four, Paul says, when Christ, who is your life, he's your real life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And he's talking about the second coming of Christ. When Christ comes back, we will come back with him and we will help him establish his kingdom upon the earth and we will live and reign with him as kings and priests forever and ever and ever. And according to the Bible, that thousand year reign of Christ upon the earth where he fixes all the things that are screwed up here is only temporary. 
Because after that, he destroys the heavens and the earth as we know them. The old order, it says, passes away, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem, and we will live and reign with Christ there for all of eternity. So that's what we should be hoping for, not hoping that the price of gas comes down or we have a change of administration or regime. God bless you. Look forward to getting back to you tomorrow. Blessings.